Hi guys, welcome back to the MVM show. I'm Titus, your host, and I am joined again by Jordan from Duck Gun Chronicles and also Hunter Roenfeld, um, co-host and hunting partner to Jordan. You guys know Jordan. We just did an episode recently with him. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. If you haven't listened to it yet, check it out. Um, I think you'll really enjoy it. We get into some good topics and do some catching up and he's got some big plans. So trust me, you want to check it out. But I think a lot of people are going to be excited today about this episode because we haven't had what I would say a lot of experts and not to put Hunter on the spot saying he's an expert because he probably won't say that about himself. But so I've heard um, that he does know a lot about it and has a lot of experience and been duck hunting for a long time. But Jordan, it's nice to have you up back on. Hunter, it's it's good to have you on the show for the first time. Thank glad to be here. Glad to be here. Yeah, so let's let's dig right in. We've been nobody knows the behind the scenes, all the issues and the uploads and trying to get stuff going. We've been podcasting for quite a while and we're burning having the fun now. But yeah, we are. We're having a lot of fun. And I'm actually um you guys need to check out for sure. I don't know our timing of the episodes, but keep your guys' eyes peeled on Jordan's podcast, Jordan and Hunter's podcast the episode where we go on there and we talk duck boats. And uh, I really enjoyed that because I learned a lot of stuff from Hunter stuff that he was bringing up. He's been doing a lot longer than Thomas or I have. And a lot of things he said, I was like, man, I never thought of that. So you definitely want to go check that out on the duck gun podcast and check out Jordan's channel, YouTube channel, um, duck gun chronicles. And um, also on Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff. You guys can find some great content there and good videos and just a good friends. It's good to have you join in. Hopefully Hunter, we can become better acquainted and friends as well. And maybe sometime ever hunt together, but let's get into diver hunting guys. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and I, I'm excited to hear the tips and Hunter, I'd like to just start out with how, do, how did you get into diver hunting? So I got into diver hunting kind of on a, a fluke deal. I got invited on a hunt by, a, we'll call him a local legend type of a guy, a guy that's diver hunted here for a long time. And he invited me out on a hunt and it was a brutal day. I mean, like absolutely brutal. Uh, three foot rollers on the river, blowing snow, just like the the stereotypical boats got water freezing on it from the from the spray. And we're sitting, we were sitting along the shoreline, but we were sitting in the boat because the shoreline's steep enough. We can get the boats right along it. And we sat there for like an hour and just stared at snow, just pelting you in the face, you know, typical, typical snow morning. And as the snow kind of cleared and I like looked down river from where we were at and it literally looked like a black cloud of birds. It was at the time, the most birds I've ever seen in one single spot in my entire life. And I'm like, hey, man, that's a lot of blackbirds down there. And the guy's like, no, and no, on simple words, he said, sit down and be quiet because it's about to get fun. And I think it took us, I don't know, like five or 10 minutes to shoot a three-man limb and a canvas backs. And I think it took us another 30 minutes to shoot all 18 birds. We ended up finishing off with some ringnecks, scop, uh, a couple redheads, if I remember right. We ended wow. up shooting all of our birds and getting out of there before the snow got any worse. But, yeah, it was a, it was like one of those – one of those events when you look back that like, I'll always remember like that first canvas back hunt and they, the way they were coming to the decoys and just these big wads of birds was just so cool. So yeah. that was like the start was just like, obviously having a good hunt right off the beginning definitely sets the hook pretty deep. And then I started coming pretty good friends with that guy. And one thing led to another and now I'm, I'm out there hunting them. Wow. Now, how how old were you at the time, and had you already been duck hunting for quite some time before you got into that? Or was that your first trip? No, that was uh, – I'd been duck hunting for a long time. I was uh, – at the time, I owned my shop, so I would have been 21, 22, somewhere in that time frame. Uh, so five, six years ago now is when I got into mm-hmm. diver hunting, and I had already been duck hunting, like seriously, for probably about five years before that, and then I'd been mm-hmm. duck hunting. Yeah, I duck hunted when I was a kid and stuff too, but obviously – going out five, 10 times a year is not as serious as going out 40 plus times a year. Right. Right. That's what I would say. I, I kind of have, I, I would say probably hmm, 10 years was like that. Like you said, I thought I was hunting a lot when I hit a 10 mark, 10th hunt of the year. I thought, man, I was, I was 
really getting my money's worth. And now it's like 40, 50 times a season. So I totally hear you on that. So, so basically you got into it. You got into diver hunting. Is that your favorite type of hunting? Is that what you prefer? Or? Yeah. So my favorite bird to chase is a canvas back. Um, divers are like, they're my favorite thing to hunt. If it wasn't for canvas backs, I don't think I'd do it as much. It's mm-hmm. just because of the way the canvas backs are. And we'll get into that more. But um, the thing that's really nice about it here where I'm at is I get to start off the year. We have the early teal season and we do, we have pretty good success with that. So we get to hunt the early teal season and then it rolls into the first part of our duck season where we're shooting a lot of wood ducks. So we get like the, them screaming through timber cuts and you get like that experience. And then you move on, you shoot gadwalls and pintails for a couple weeks. And then you get to shoot mallards in fields. And then like right as usually the mallards and the gadwall kind of like stale out there's always like that mid-november stale where all those birds get nocturnal and they just don't want to work and there's just a bunch of people have already hunted them for a week and a half two weeks straight and that's when the divers tend to show up so rather than just slugging it out for a couple more mallards i just throw all those decoys in the shed and grab the divers and i go chase divers for the rest of the year Hmm. so it gives me like that great like yeah i get a i get to encompass a lot of the waterfowl stuff and it's a like i said about a time i'm starting to get bored of hunting mallards i know that a lot of people will be like kind of upset with that statement but about the time i'm like kind of getting bored of it and ready for a change up then i get to go hunt divers for the next couple of weeks and then season's over and we hunt geese for another couple of weeks and we're done so that's kind of how you're ending your season then is with divers yeah that's the last like bird like the uh duck species that i'm chasing is is divers yeah and they move in i've i was uh and he's talking to to us about coming back to Wisconsin and um we we hunted the Mississippi up there and man it was that was such a cool experience and uh when we were leaving out of there getting ready to go back home before we left we were driving by the river and I seen like what you talked about I seen what is that like that can't be ducks you know and it was like thousands of canvasbacks and I love canvasbacks so that's why I kind of was excited about this because I would like to hear your strategies and how you hunt them. And I, I'm sure it's a, maybe a little different out here, but I would assume most of it's kind of the same techniques, styles, maybe tips that you can give and, and what it, kind of what it looks like for you. Maybe if it's kind of the end of your season, what, I, I don't even know. There's so many ways we can go with this, but like, what are you? Tynus, I, gotta, you know, I don't yeah, want to go derail you too much, but yeah. I, I got a question for you kind of, and I don't have as much, you know, to add from the diver perspective, cause I'm not a diver hunter. Uh, but I'm sure Hunter will get me on him and, and do his best to change my mind. Uh, but I will say I'll never get tired of uh, chasing mallards um, or wood ducks, yeah, but I agree potentially divers as well. But where, where do divers fall in your hierarchy as far as um, as, as the duck species and, and what you're chasing? Like as far as how important they are to me versus other ducks? Right, right. Honestly, pretty low. I would say, um, except for canvas backs, I don't know what I why I have a thing for canvas backs, but um, Mallard's super high up on that list. So I totally understand what he's saying, and I don't take that wrongly. Like some people are like, oh, bro, Mallard's, Mallard's, right? <laughs> it's not that you're bored of hunting Mallard's, right, Hunter? It's just you know there's a change up coming. It's not your only option. Mm-hmm. So you're, it's a, it's like a, almost like a re rush again, right? Sure of something new, even though it's still the same season. So I totally get what you're saying there because I love hunting mallards, but it's all about where you're at and what you can hunt. Right. People are freaking out that we shoot shovelers. Like it's opportunity. Exactly. Jordan, you talk about it a lot. And I know Elliot gives you a hard time about that, but he knows, I mean, he, he's doing that too. Obviously we know he's doing it on purpose, but it's like, it's totally about, um, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder and like, depending on what's available to you, that's, what's going to be so important. So yes, there is lots, there is a lot of mallards out here. Right. And there there is something to, there is something to like uh, having people kind of appreciate it the same way as you too. So I I can understand Hunter's perspective on that. And and Hunter, you you stated like, there's something about canvas back. We'll get into it, but um, I I, want to know what, what it is. I've never shot one. Um, and Titus, I know you shot them, and, and you're saying now too, it's uh, there's something about the canvas back above other divers, and people call it the king of the, you know, the king of the ducks. Mm. So, I mean, what is it? Go ahead, go ahead. All right. right. So for me personally, it's the way that they work into a spread. Mm-hmm. So the only thing I'm gonna start with the biggest negative: canvas backs 
you can't really call at them there. You can do like, there's a diver call where you roll essentially like roll your R into a normal mallard call. And it's kind of like a chuckle that they make when they're on the water, but it doesn't really do anything. Like you're doing that to make noise, to make yourself feel better. I guess is the best way to say it. (laughs) But the thing that they, they come into a spread totally differently than a, than a typical dabbler does. And so you have to set your spreads different, but the way that they come into a spread is I can't even really explain it because they're either there or they're not. And when they come in, they're coming in just reckless abandonment straight into your face. And they just, they want to be there and they want to be feeding. And so when they do it, it's just, it's such a special experience. And I think the scarcity is also another thing that drives it, right? Like you can only shoot two. It's not very Mm -hmm. common for a lot of guys to go out and shoot. Um, I think I shot like 20 Drake canvas backs last year. So like, it's not common for people to have that kind of opportunity. So it's also kind of that, but just the way they come into a spread is so magical. And the only thing about canvas back hunting that is different than dabblers, at least in my area is typically we get the early morning flight of dabblers leaving the roost, going out to feed. Then you kind of get the low flight coming back and the low flight usually isn't as good as that early morning going out to feed. If you got a good food spot and then you get the night roost. And I almost never hunt the the night flight coming back. But with divers, they will fly pretty consistently for most of the day if it's like a day that they need to be feeding. Mm -hmm. And so you can set up and take turns hunting. You know, you have like a it's a slower but more steady pace of a hunt. And I think it you know makes the hunts take longer. It just you you look down at your phone and you're never like, ah man, it's it's only eight o'clock. Like ah, you know, it's like ah man, like Teddy's kind of dragging. You look down and you're like, holy crud, it's noon and I have something to be doing in 10 minutes. Like I got to pick up and get out of here because it's just hmm. it's just steady watching birds and steadily having stuff work and trying to figure out how to make them come in for the day. Is that dependent on weather? Like, I mean, when you say they're like out all day, you know, I think of mallards. The re- only reason that mallards would be doing that at all is because it is freezing right like it's zero degrees it's five degrees they have to feed they have to go back and forth from the feed to the water to the feed to the water when in this scenario where like let's say canvas backs are out and about all day is that the same reason why or is, is is there something different yeah so some of it is weather dependent and i'd be lying to you if i said i knew why because some days you'll go out and you're like eh, it's blowing it's blowing wind and it's cold mm-hmm. and it's cruddy outside and then you're like, they're going to move all day. And then you go sit out there and watch like two move, two birds move. And it was mm-hmm. like, what? Well, this isn't exactly at all what I expected. And then you go out there on a day when it's 45 degrees and sunny and birds don't stop flying until one mm-hmm. in the afternoon. And so sometimes it's just, I, I don't know. I know a lot of it is due to food and like where they go to get food. And so that's one of the things that drives us here is because there's a, uh, uh, I can't get into it too much because they'll give away the spots, but there are certain areas that are better with certain winds and there's certain mm-hmm. areas you can't hunt because of laws. Mm-hmm. And so uh, like on certain winds, it's just it, all the birds go to one area. You can't go in certain other winds. You got, you know, the birds tend to feed with the wind line. So it's like, uh, it's just, it just depends, I guess is the best way to say it. And again, I do not know. I just go out and hunt them every day and then get lucky on four out of five hunts. <laughs> Yeah. I'd say it's less do, predictable than than puddle ducks. I'd say it's um it's less predictable to be like oh it's crappy outside let's go hunt divers because they're going to move all day. But I mean you're still going to have a certain amount of percentage chance that it's it's the same. But it doesn't seem to be as hard fast as I've noticed with puddle ducks. Huh. Which again maybe that's another reason why I like chasing them is because I just don't have it nailed down. Yeah. And that does definitely have a draw. I think when you, if you're that kind of person, you want to become the best at it. And if you get your telling kick, sometimes it draws you back for more. Because I've said that, like certain places I went or states I went, I felt like it got the best of me. And I'm like, I ain't never coming back here. And then next year I'm back there again because I'm like, I'm not going to let this thing beat me, you know? Yep. So that must be how, what the draw of diver hunting has on you. Um, so what's your... I don't know if this is going to jump ahead of what you're trying to do, but like, what's your boat set up for this? Cause it sounds like from an episode I recorded for duck on podcast, you were talking about that and like, you don't have a boat. You don't have nothing. Kind of yeah. sounds like, yeah, you don't have a boat. You're not hunting divers. So mm-hmm. I have a 1860 havoc MSTC with a mud buddy 5,000 on it. 
Um, biggest part of my boat, uh, other than just the boat itself, is the blind. Uh, I run a hacked up beaver tail blind on it. And so the big thing about that with diver hunting is since it folds all to one side, there's nothing on the gunnel on one side of the boat. So when we're setting out long lines and we're like throwing decoys over the side of the boat, cause that's what we're typically doing with divers. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nothing for the, the long lines to get caught on. There's nothing for you know us to get tripped up in. There's nothing for the dog to get caught on if they need to go out and get birds. And so since the blind is all the way on one side, even if we're not using it, we're able to just like to use the other side of the boat and have that smooth side to throw decoys off of, which is really, really nice. Um, hmm. We hunt, it's probably split somewhere around 50, 50, pretty close on days that we hunt out of layout boats versus when we hunt from the shoreline. So uh, like I said, half the time we're hunting out of the open water layout boats. We have a couple different styles we can use, but uh, last year I used uh, the four rivers teal chasers pretty much exclusively. Um, mm. In the past I've used the homemade canvas or not canvas uh, fiberglass over wood kind of look like a pumpkin seed with this a square hole in the middle of them. Um, I've used all sorts of different layout boats. So, but yeah, half the time we use those and the other half time we put the boat blind up and we sit along a shoreline or sit underneath like a tree that's like hanging over the shoreline. So you never use the boat blind out in open water then? No, the only time we use the boat blind out in open water is when you set the layout boats out. Um, the thing that's nice about the beaver tail blind is it flips over and like literally two seconds right like Mm -hmm. not even an exaggeration it's up to down in less than less than five seconds and so when we set like the layout boats out and then you take the run boat and we usually have an anchor with a buoy that way that we don't need to pull the anchor in and out you drive over to the buoy you clip the boat to the buoy and then that's Mm -hmm. where like the run boat sits waiting for the guys in the layout boats to shoot birds and then you go pick them up obviously Hmm. Um, but we'll set with the layout with the blind up when we're doing that sometimes if it's cold and that's only really to keep the wind off you put a heater inside of it just so you're warm while you're sitting there hanging out and that's another thing about layout hunting that's really cool with divers is you set the layout boats and i usually run two because we're usually running groups of like four to five guys and so we'll set two layout boats out and then the rest of the guys are just you're just hanging out like you just you're going to do exactly what we're doing now, only you're also a part of the hunt. And since the divers kind of fly consistently, you know, the guys in the boats shoot a couple birds, go till they're uncomfortable or cold, and then you just flip people out and then they get a hunt. And honestly, it's one of the things I really enjoy about diver hunting is that I don't have to be the one pulling the trigger in order to have mm-hmm. like a really good fun day. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, I mean, we've talked about kill dependent hunters and stuff like that. And yeah. I think everybody is a kill dependent hunter. That's my like uh, personal philosophy is everybody's kill dependent hunter to a certain degree. But one of the things I, I like have like really myself have evolved is like, I really do like getting people out and letting them hunt the birds. Yeah. And like, I really do genuinely enjoy just sitting back watching people just smoke birds. Like you're watching them through binoculars and you watch a big flock fly in and you know, the guys are jacked up and you watch them smoke a couple birds out of it and you get to go out and pick them up and yeah. hoop and holler and then have a good time. And yeah. Yeah. Now that's why I like taking young guys, young guys, new people like the, of different ages I've taken out and like it is such a rush and such an amazing feeling. Like it's every bit of good as you shooting or better than shooting a band or some rare bird. Like it's so awesome. So like, I totally get that. I I think why that sounds fun to me, what you're doing, because see, like when I'm chasing mallards or whatever, personally, again, this is just me. I don't like a big group. I like, I like myself or my brother or one other guy, three people like at most, right. Just for hide and just talking and calling, just whatever. But like in that scenario, when I have done layout hunting um, in, in uh, Wisconsin, out there on uh, what what is that? Um, what lake is that? Oh, my mind's just shooting a blank. Um, on the Great Lakes, anyways. But out there doing that was cool because, like you said, the guys that's not in the layout that are in the main boat, whatever you guys are calling that, three, four, five guys. Who cares, right? Like, who cares how many are in there? And you're laughing, have a good time, eating breakfast, doing whatever. Like you said, and it totally changes the dynamic of it, and that is that is pretty cool. I, I don't know if that's what makes you like that so much, but I, I would think so. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a factor. It's like, uh, uh, I, I'm the same way. I like to hunt with three guys or less when I'm puddle duck mm-hmm. hunting. And just mm-hmm. generally speaking, I want to be with three guys or less. Mm-hmm. And like, you can be with a bigger group when you diver hunt, even though like, again, we try to keep it less than five, like five or six, mm-hmm. but 
you know, we've hunted as many as 11 before and that was incredible. But it was probably good hunting, huh? Uh, yeah, we we'll, we killed an 11 man limit of canvasbacks in one flock. So what? Yeah, it's it's like, wild. Can we talk about that story real quick? Yeah. So essentially, <laughs> shaking his head and, and <laughs> to make a no, no, I'm, I'm to glad make to a long story, story really short because it was one flock and that's all we did the whole day is we kind of had like a stack up of events. So what happened was is I had planned to hunt with some guys. And the guy who actually introduced me to duck hunt or into canvas back hunting, he had planned to hunt with some guys. And we always, I always bounce stuff back and forth since he introduced me. Hey, this is where I'm going. This is what we got going on. And usually we're pretty good. We work together. We don't always hunt together, but we usually work together. And he was like, hey, man, let's just all hunt together. And I was like, that sounds like a really horrible idea. Like, I'm not going to lie to you, given that many guys, you know, just lined up along the shoreline, essentially. Like, mm-hmm. it's just not, not going to work. And he's like, nah, I think oh, he's like, I'll run the hunt. It'll be my hunt and we'll just do it. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, it's yours. And we set up and it was one of those like just kind of mornings. We saw birds flying out in the open water. But again, we were along a shoreline. And then all of a sudden we had a, a decent flock work us. And one of the things about canvasbacks, if you've never seen them work in a flock, is they don't circle like up and behind you like a mallard does. They circle always out in front and they stay out in front of the spread. And they work in a figure eight. So they actually like make a figure eight pattern if you were to draw mm. it from the sky. And they get in this figure eight. But unlike mallards, we're like there's like if there's six birds in a flock, they're all kind of following each other around mm-hmm. their flight pattern. Where with cans, when they come in and there's like a hundred in a flock, they're at all different parts of this figure eight, right? Like they're not hmm. all in one group flying the figure eight. They might be but in there's, five, but they're six still doing birds. a figure eight. Yeah. And they'll just do huh. a figure eight. And then they'll come off at random points of the figure eight. So they're not always going to come off of the corner and fly straight down the lines. They're not always going to come. They might come 90 degrees or 180 degrees from the wind and fly into the spread. Like it's just kind of random sometimes. And we had this flock and they came through the spread and they kept giving us like that, like 30 yard, 25 yard passing shot. And I got to give it to this other guy because I would have called the shot like five times over, like just no <laughs> bull. I would have called it. And he's like, he's like, hey, don't shoot. Don't shoot. We're going to wait for him. They're going to do it. They're going to do it. And sure enough, they gave a pass and like two thirds of these birds landed down and they really, really set into the spread. And he called the shot and it literally looked like he took a razor knife and cut the bottom of the flock out and 22 birds fell. And it was wow. exactly an 11 man limit of canvasbacks. Wow. Everybody picked out their two birds and shot, and it was honestly the most incredible rain out I've ever seen wow. in my entire life. That's uh, I haven't heard of many rain outs too, like right? that. <laughs> yeah, they were not all drakes, but they were all. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was pretty pretty drake heavy, which is kind of typical. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, I saw the I saw the pictures from it. That's um, that's super cool. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, that's insane. Yeah, it's that's cool. And and you you must have been with a decent group of guys because some people <laughs> for you to come in with a group like that and only end up with 22 exactly i would say that there's times i could see a lot of times people that's not happening yeah there might um, be accidentally. Yeah, it, and that's one of the things that why the other guy was kind of comfortable with setting it up is because it was actually a bunch all 11 of us were pretty heavy water fowlers i think the mm-hmm. the least I'm going to call it like senior person, least seasoned person in the group probably hunts like 20 times a year for the last five to 10 years. So like even he's, you know, I'd still consider that to be a pretty serious guy. So yeah. 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 Right. For sure. So what, if a guy is wanting to get into canvas back hunting specifically, and I I know we were saying divers, but I am, I am intrigued by cans. So let's stick there for maybe the rest of it. I don't know. We'll see what time allows, but if if I'm wanting to get into it, what are you suggesting? I mean, I know it's everything costs money, right? But like, what is the way to do it to be the most efficient and cost effective? So the the first thing I'd say, if you want to get into canvas back hunting, is to know if there's canvas backs in the area that you hunt, because. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of areas you could have the perfect canvas pack set up and you'll never shoot a canvas pack just because right, they're just right. they're just not there mm-hmm. or, you know, they, they fly differently. I know that they shoot them in the in the prairies quite a bit, but they f- shoot them totally different than how we do. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're wanting to get in like the water, like more open water canvas back hunting, 
is actually uh, I would suggest getting decoys first. So <laughs> getting canvas back and redhead decoys and literally get as many as your pocketbook can allow. Really? Um, you need a yeah. lot, huh? Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where when they're sitting in a raft and there's 50,000 in a raft and you have six decoys, you're probably not <laughs> yeah. doing anything with your six okay. decoys. I hear you now. I so you. like for reference, and again, I'm way into it, but yeah, no. I run – uh, somewhere between 10, 15 dozen decoys. And usually that's uh, mostly canvas backs and redheads. And then we also okay. mix in scop decoys because we do shoot quite a bit of scop. And then later we move the scop out and we put in buffle heads, but that's a different, different story. And, but yeah, I mean, I would, I would start with at least a couple dozen canvas back decoys if you want to okay. get into it and be wrong, be prepared to be wrong a lot about setting up decoys. Cause they, the way you set up, uh, like canvas back spreads is totally backwards from what you'd expect on a puddle duck. So typically, you know, let's just say like the typical U shape puddle duck spread, you want the open end of the U to be facing where the birds are going to fly in and then they're going to fly right into the U and you want them to set with the wind with the, you know, the U pointing towards the wind, I think you're pointing against the wind. I don't know how it's like how to word that, mm -hmm. but with like canvas backs, when we set them, we set them on long lines, which isn't necessary if you have, you know, shallow enough water, you can use single drops, but, uh, you set them and we set them to where the birds have to fly down the long lines. And then we put a ball pretty much at the end of the long lines. Cause what the birds want to do is they want to get on the upstream side or the upwind side of the feed ball. Cause they want to like shortstop the other birds to the feed. Mm. So when we set them up, we'll set all that stuff up to where if like uh we usually set a crossing wind shot i should also specify that we almost oh, always okay, set really? a crossing wind spot shot okay and so um if the wind's coming from the left going to the right we'll set the decoys almost all to the right of us so that the birds want to finish right in yep. front because mm -hmm. they'll like fly over themselves because they want to get to the head of the feed line is essentially which is, how it works. which is funny because a lot of um dabblers don't do that i'm not yeah, yeah. They don't yeah, they, do that really, right? No, so they that's don't, so don't want to do it. Right. That's a huge tip right there. Thank you. Okay. I'm with yeah. you. So that's the first Sorry, thing. I didn't mean and, to cut you off. It was just interesting. Now you're good. And like I said, we use long lines because it's easier for how we hunt. Not necessary, but it's definitely nice. And we'll set long lines. Um, my long lines are 150 foot long, and I put a dozen on each long line. So they're about 10 foot apart from each other, each decoy okay. on the line. And then we set the long lines about five to 10 yards of spacing between the lines so that the birds can fly down them and then they can look mm. down them. Cause the other advantage of a long line is when you, the birds are coming in canvas backs tend to fly higher than other divers. they tend to fly around here, like somewhere around that, like 30, 40 yards in the air. And so when they're out a ways with the long lines, it looks like more decoys than you actually have. It looks like more birds on the water. And mm. so they'll come. And then what you really want them to do is you want them to fly between the long lines and then set on the upstream side of the long lines where you kind of have a ball that they have to set into. Can I, so, ask you, can I jump in there? Ask a question it. on the ball. Mm -hmm. Since you're, you have a string of decoys, which is totally different than a ball. How are you setting up the ball? So like, are you, are you, are you bringing them in like that? Like, yes. Or yeah. So we will kind of make like an arrow shape and like bring them in like a triangle kind of shape. Okay. We'll bring the last decoys towards that. Uh, the other thing is uh, I have a shorter long line set. Uh, I'm calling it a long line, but this one's only like probably 30 or 40 feet long, and it's got mm -hmm. a bunch of decoys on it, uh, and I'll okay. set it perpendicular to the other decoys, and I have two of those. So if I set those mm -hmm. perpendicular to the other ones, when they're flying down, obviously they can't see that there are two lines of decoys. Yeah, so that allows like them to do that. Yep. Huh, and then okay. the other thing is, too, I always keep you know six, eight, ten decoys on drop lines. So I will – where we actually hunt them is usually pretty shallow, less than six foot. Oh, so nice. uh, we'll actually throw out single drops and uh, to make the the ball of the spread. Mm, okay. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah, keep going. I, I I was just wanted curious about that. So that, cause that's huge. That decoy setup. Yeah. And the other thing with uh canvas back decoys or with any diver decoys is yeah, you want to get foam filled if you can afford them. Um, obviously like it, you want to get foam filled if you can afford them. And you, you got to be not afraid to shoot your decoys. Like I know they're expensive, but they're, they're, they're replaceable. <laughs> like, unfortunately speaking, they're replaceable. And the other big thing that we do, uh, I use flock of flickers in my spreads. So I have like four or six flock of flickers and I have those set up on uh, the drop lines. Uh, another 
I guess tip is we have the long lines and then we also use the drop lines. So what a drop line is, it goes from a decoy and some of them you can buy, they're only like 12 inches long. I use 36 inch long drops. So that makes it to where your long line is lower in the water. So if we're running dogs on the shoreline, the dogs don't get mm. caught up in the long lines nearly as often. Um, and the other thing that's nice about them is if you have to, you can drive through the long lines with a boat and not be too worried about getting hung up on them when you oh, have okay. deeper drops like that. Um, but yeah, I'll put a flock of flickers on those. And then if we're running layout boats, we'll put, uh, I mean, literally it's a stick with a trash bag on it with like a kitchen trash bag. And we'll use that as a flag. So flag birds. So just like you would like with a goose, you can flag the birds coming in. Hmm. Wow. Those are a lot of great tips. Jordan, you have anything that you probably have all kinds of questions rolling through your head. Cause I know yeah, you're man, a uh, major diver guy. Yeah. <laughs> Puddlers are a superior. No, it's a, it's a, it's really, <clears throat> it's really cool to hear. Yeah. And um, I'm gonna actually get to experience it this year, so um, I, I'm I'm uh, low key excited for it. I don't yeah. want to tell Hunter too much that I'm excited. Yeah, for don't. It, but... Yeah, you got to keep him thinking. You know. Well, yeah. One of know. the things that'll be really cool about this year is with the big project boat. Um, mm-hmm. Is that we're the plan? If everything works out, is we'll actually be able to use that as what we're going to call like a mothership. So we'll be able to anchor yeah. that out in the open water, and then we'll be able to set the uh, the layout boats out, and then essentially use that as like our hangout spot. So we can set the layout boats with the with so the and everything. Yeah, and we can run back and forth with the regular mud boats, and then just hang out inside of there. <laughs> you can take a nap. I mean, you can do whatever you want to do. Cook lunch. You could go uh, skinny dipping Sleeping off on the, the bed, top of the boat and the just window. jump in and go swimming. <laughs> yep. And then, like, you can just sit on the back deck with binoculars and watching people hunt. And, like, dude, dude how cool is that? Yeah. Man. I've I might, high expectations. I might I'm not going to lie. I bet you do. So, I wonder if there's any <laughs> kind of interesting rules about anchoring down like that. Is there anything weird that there's rules they have, regulations, like you could stay here so long, or is it just free game? So uh, that's all what we're going to be in is in the upper Mississippi wildlife refuge. Um, if you've never looked into it, any of the viewers, anything, you should definitely look into what is the upper Mississippi wildlife refuge, but it's essentially all of the Mississippi from it's somewhere like up by Minneapolis all the way down to just North of Davenport, Iowa is a considered refuge. And so it's got its own like uh, rules and everything like that to hunt it. And it's all public hunting between essentially it's public hunting between the railroad tracks is how it generally speaking is, but there's maps online that show everything. Mm. And, um, I'm not highlighting anything. Cause I just said like no, but 300 just miles to, of river. Really? But, okay. I was going to ask you, I was just curious how long shoot, that's yeah, a lot, I, man. It's a, it's a huge, I, I don't know the exact like numbers on it, but if you actually like took the acreage of what it covers, it's a, it's an absolutely massive refuge. 300 miles. Within, just, that saying that right there is insane yeah and then within that there are uh no access areas for waterfowl hunting so there are areas within Mm -hmm. the refuge that are not able for you to be able to go in and hunt so they're like they're what everybody calls the refuges because that's where the birds tend to like that's what we do too we call that that's like the closed zone right Refuge, Mm -hmm. whatever so there's that but since we are going to be in the upper mississippi wildlife refuge there are some laws about anchoring the boat um one of them is that like we're not allowed to stay in the same place for more than I can't remember if it's a week or two weeks straight, but oh, there's some plenty though. You're, yeah, you're not allowed to be in the same place for more than two weeks. Obviously, you're not allowed to anchor in the na- in like the main channel. You can't impede the shipping traffic because oh. we have a lot of barge traffic through here, so you can't impede that. Um, one of the other weird ones is that like you have to be on the boat every 24 hours, so like you can't like anchor it and then just leave Abandon it there it. for two yeah. weeks. You have to be there every 24 hours and be on it. But other than that, um, the only other major rules we really have to worry about uh, with what we're going to be doing is uh, there's no – you can't leave decoys out after – it's 30 minutes after sunset. You have to pull all your decoys in. Hmm. So even though we'll be out there for like you – know, let's just say we're going to be out there for three days with the mothership. Every night we have to pull our decoy spread in. Every night we'll have to throw it out, which that is what sense. I prefer to do anyways yeah. because yeah. you have to reset it for the wind and everything else. You might as well just right. pull it in, right? Takes or you're moving hour. or something. I mean – Exactly. So yeah. that's not that big of a thing, but yeah, there's no, you can't have your decoys out like that. And then the way the law really reads is kind of funny, but we'll be technically camping when we're in the boat is what it'll be like classified as is camping. Mm-hmm. And so 
because of that, we can be on the refuge. But typically speaking, you have to be off the refuge. I think it's like by like 11 o'clock at night. And then you can't be back on the refuge till two in the morning if you're not mm. quote unquote camping. But there's some other gray area weirdness, but we got it all straight. We'll be good to go. Yeah, yeah. No, and that and that's the thing is, is people want to do stuff like that or go to other states. People always ask me like, you know, like, uh, how do you do this without getting in trouble? Or how do you, it's like, man, you just, you got to read. Like, you can't expect everyone else to do it for you. Like, you got to get in the book yourself and check because i tell you what, it's not, you do not want to go to another state and get in trouble or break some rules or get a ticket and just, it just doesn't look good. I mean, accidents do happen and there's sometimes things aren't maybe clearly marked and Onyx has really eliminated a lot of that. It's really helped a lot, but I will say this. Definitely don't want to just solely de depend on that. You definitely want to get the regulations for the area, for the state, whatever it is that you hunt in. But yeah, and that's interesting, man. That's going to be, that is going to be so epic. Like, I don't see how, like you said, whether it's killing or not, how is that not going to be amazing? Yeah. I mean, exactly. I mean, I'm glowing up just like thinking about it, man. I'm so excited <laughs> for it. Like, huh. it's just, I, I'm just having a daydream of like cooking food on the boat yeah. and like, getting to watch your buddies is like this year I actually helped a couple of my buddies shoot their first canvas backs. And so like watching them just get super jacked up about shooting mm -hmm. their first birds. And then they get to come back. And like, one of the things that again is cool about diver hunting is once you like shoot your birds and you're done in the layout boats where you get uncomfortable and you want to switch out, well then you come back and you sit inside of the other boat and you get to immediately like tell your freaking war stories, right? Like you could yeah. immediately talk about how cool it was that the birds came in and they were doing this and we need to set the spread like this next time. And like, you're immediately like talking about all that. And I really, yeah. I really like that. Now we're going to be able to do it with a, hopefully a wood fireplace rolling and we're just going to be able to sit inside out of the wind and be able to do the same thing. There ain't nothing but epicness about that whole scenario. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have Literally. to put like a whiteboard on the wall so we can draw out what we want to do. <laughs> that that is a good idea. I would be Jordan. That's you need to add that. It it, uh, it, it would clash with the uh, aesthetic I'm going with the cabin. But <laughs> what what is the aesthetic, by the way? <laughs> We'd have to have like a chalkboard, I think. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's actually that'd be fun. I set the sound of it in your ears when someone's right on it. <laughs> Never liked that, but. Oh, right, man. we got a young Padawan who can clean it every night or the something. Like well, man, if he's editing you know, the episodes and everything, you know, I want to say, hey, right what now. else could you get him to do? <laughs> <laughs> hey, so are you the mo are you the engine guy? Hunter? Yeah, on the boat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm so, the, what do you I'm... think? Tell us what what is the odds of this thing firing up and purring like a kitten? Uh, I would say decently high. But it's okay. only going to be decently high after I spend eight hours making it decently high. Okay. So eight like, hours—that's not too crazy bad, is it? Eight hours. No. Or, so did you say eight or eighty? Eight. eight. <laughs> 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 no, so there's a there's a I have the whole service manuals for the uh, engine. You know, luckily mm -hmm. enough, knowing people helps out. So I have the whole service manual set for the engine, the the master manual set, and we're going to go through the whole service process on it. There's a you know, 20 pages of service. And we're just, I'm just going to go through and I'm just going to do the entire major service on it. And that way everything will be set, right. Everything will be good to go. And then we'll worry about starting it. And I've, it's an all mechanical motor. Everything so far looks pretty good on it. So mm -hmm. I got, I have high hopes that it'll be done, but for those that don't know, it's a 471 Detroit diesel, which is a two stroke with a supercharger, which is just, oh, wow. just kind of weird. It's an old kind of setup. But hmm. if you get a chance, you got to look up like D you just got to Google search Detroit running away or something like that. So what they do is they have a problem where something gets stuck inside of the motor to oversimplify it. Something gets stuck and the motors just continuously rev up until they literally explode. So we're going to hmm. do everything we can to avoid doing that because that's pretty <laughs> common on motors that have sat. So we're going to do all, everything we can to make it to where they don't just just doesn't rev up and start hucking parts out of the boat. At least we'll go really fast before it blows up. Yeah, it'll be really cool for about 30 seconds. I mean, it'll make a great <laughs> video for about 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, well, you know, Jordan's pretty confident that it'll float. That's that's number one. And then no runaway motors. That's number two. And then after that, it sounds like you guys got everything else dialed in. You're going to you got some spots to diver hunt. You got the tools. You got the decoys. You got the guns. You got the friends. So 
I have faith in you guys. I, I think it's going to be amazing. As soon as Jordan did that Marco Polo for the first time, I would, I, what did we, we talked about the last episode, Jordan. I said, Jordan, yeah. that's epic. Insane, but epic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the more Sums we it talked about well. it and the more I hear all the details, I'm like, dude, that's a genius. Really, it really is. <laughs> and it's going to, it's, I mean, as long as everything goes as planned as far as the floating in the, the engine, I mean, that's, it's going to work. Like, there's no doubt that you guys yeah. are going to do really well in it. Have fun. Yeah. And like a little bit of a backstory on it, um, like for me personally, was my dad and I have always talked about, it was always like talked in the essence of being a retirement project mm -hmm. about buying a boat and essentially following the migration all the way south and how cool it would be to follow the migration all the way south in the Mississippi. And, you know, obviously there's probably way cheaper and way easier ways to shoot birds, <laughs> but it's about the experience, about the excitement right, of it all. Right. And we, I'd talked about that since I'd really gotten into duck hunting with my dad. And so it's kind of cool that now we get to talk about it in a sense that's not like, I don't have to wait till I'm retired. I can do it when I'm 28 instead of right. when I'm 65. <laughs> really enjoy it to the fullest and get to do it with your dad on top of that or friends and whoever you guys yeah. are taking out there. That's pretty awesome, man. Jordan, mm -hmm. well done. One dollar <laughs> for lifetime of memories. <laughs> so, yeah. so you yeah, didn't, I never asked dollar. you on the last <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you on the last one, but now that you're in Marina, what's it going to cost you just to get it from the spot to the water? Um, it's not too bad. I would say like 500 bucks, yeah. I think to get it there. Yeah. He quoted so, us like some of that bucks. stuff. And now once you're yeah. in there though, you're good though, right? Like you don't got to get it out and move it anywhere else again. Well, <laughs> you have to take it out in the winter and stuff like that. Well, but, but I mean like you can drive to your location where you're going to start hunting. Right. Yeah. Okay. What is that thing gonna go? I know we need to end this. We've been it's forty five minutes right now. But <laughs> were you? Um, how fast is that gonna travel? Like, like just an average cruising speed. Like, what will it be? Right. We're not, we're not too sure yet. But I mean, somewhere probably about ten love miles per okay. hour. Um, not that speed matters. It in probably that. a little I'm just bit curious, less. Than, you know, like okay, it's not. Yeah, it's not like a speed right. boat by any. But like, means, if we're gonna go, not... we need to go up the river. Since you said there's 300 miles of it, I don't know if you. I'm not gonna ask if you're in the center or the south end or what. But like, <laughs> if you got to go 20 miles, you know, like okay, we're you know, that's not that bad. I mean, who cares? Like, you're seeing everything. How awesome is that? You know. Right. Right. Yeah. Some some parts of the trip will be us probably taking turns driving for hours. So. Yeah. Um, but you know that's part of the experience too. How cool is it though, man? It's yeah, it's cool. Right. Oh, it's a, it's gonna be mind blowing. The first time we're in the water, you guys are gonna uh, be smiling ear to ear. Oh yeah, I'm terrified of driving a 43 foot boat and trying to like the first time we gotta like dock it in a slip or something. Uh, it'll be a, a steep learning curve yeah. uh, that we'll have to learn pretty quick. Uh, we'll we'll practice. I got ways for us to practice before you have to do it. Right. So, but. No, see, the thing that's really nice, or I shouldn't say nice, it's kind of also annoying about the Mississippi is we have the lock and dam system. Yeah. So every, you know, it depends on what pool you're in, but every so often, like you'll have the break of having to go through a lock, which is in itself its own experience. And each lock is different. So hmm. there's like the, it's not going to be just monotonous 20 hours straight of us driving in a boat, but yeah, it'll be, it'll be cool. I mean, like we'll be seeing the river the way it was meant to be seen. I think, right? Like and that's scouting the at the it. same time, right? Yeah. And yeah. we'll be doing a, a lot of our trip the way it's kind of planned out. We'll be doing it when the, when the leaves are turned. So like when there'll still be leaves on the trees, but they'll all be like that orange color. And like, huh. it, it's the sights are going to yeah, be incredible. It's going to be awesome. Driving yeah. through the bluffs with the I'm boat. Jealous, will be sweet. No. <laughs> 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 when, when do I need to be there? <laughs> <laughs> So, well, guys, thanks for coming on. And, and I know rehashing a little bit of the details we didn't cover about the boat in the last one that was really interesting to hear and, and about the diver hunting. And thank you for sharing your knowledge, Hunter, with us. And staying up late to share this info on your time. I know you guys are way ahead of me in time. So, Jordan, thank you. Hunter, thank you. Yeah, appreciate you having us on. Uh, definitely uh, cool getting getting Hunter on here and, and yeah. sharing, having him share a lot of uh, what he's got going on too. So. We didn't even scratch the surface, but anyways, do you have a do you have an Instagram page, Hunter, or do you yeah. share that? Yeah, it's just okay. my name, just okay. on Instagram. So yeah, okay. and I, I really appreciate having me on, and I lo obviously I love talking about diver hunting. So oh yeah, I, anything waterfowl, I'm I'm all ears. But go check out Duck Gun Podcast. I'll be on his podcast over there a couple different times so you guys go check that out and support him and you're going to love all the other content that he puts out anyways you can check out his youtube channel duck gun chronicles we've been around longer than me 
And uh, if you guys like our channel, you'll enjoy his stuff too. And 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 the excitement of seeing what's going to take place this upcoming season. So and they're also doing videos of working through the process of building out the what's the name of it again? Did you is that finally decided? Is it still the timber? The, the SS Timber Queen. SS is, uh, Timber the Queen. official name. Yeah, we got the first two videos up of. Uh, of the working progress of the of getting the boat restored and ready for deck season. Awesome. Well, thanks again, guys, and everybody. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you guys on the next one.